host Barbies. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To our listeners and viewers who are joining us on uh, television in Region 6, New Amsterdam, all the way along the quarantine coast, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To our listeners and viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and even further afield, welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. And I want to invite you, as I would normally do, to press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your computer, on your laptop, on your um, iPad, on your tablet, or whatever device, device you are using to join us. Press that share button so that your friends and followers can join in tonight's discussion. I see Nalini Naidu, Deona Ryan Alfred, Ram Kisun, Hari Charan, Joycelyn Bishop Hussein, Mohammed Rafiq, Suratan Prasad, Mala Ramnarain, Aisha Su Chiang, Joey Ricknot, Soma Bipat, Stanley Hamilton, and so many of you are watching us already. Welcome, welcome, and please share your views on the screen, share your views in the comment section so that I can see it and I can answer and engage you, I want this program to be as engaging as I possibly can. And I would like to hear you, I would like to listen to your concerns, I would like to address uh, questions which you may have for me. So please use the comment uh, section of the live to indicate what you wish me to address. So I want to begin by saying that the government in the last sitting of the National Assembly passed some very crucial pieces of legislation. Paramount among them was the Petroleum Activities Bill. And the singular criticism which came from the opposition was the concentration of power and functional responsibilities which the bill reposes in the minister. Other than that, they have raised not a single criticism in relation to the bill. So it would appear that other than their objection to the minister being empowered in the manner that he is empowered in the bill, the bill enjoys the support of the opposition. Because not a singular criticism came from the opposition in relation to any other aspect of the bill. Nothing to do with the government, go nothing to do with the technical aspect of the bill, nothing to do with oversight, nothing to do with transparency, nothing to do with the rate of royalty, nothing to do with the fiscal provisions, nothing to do with the taxation, nothing to do with the, the unitization aspect of the bill, the licensing regime, the um, decommissioning regime, nothing. All the opposition was focused on was the concentration of power which the bill reposes in the minister. That's all. And that's a political question. So naturally, they did not agree with us politically and nothing is new about that. Their argument essentially was that they want a commission and that the minister 
should not have the powers that the minister has. They made reference to their bill in which they attempted to establish a commission in the bill. And they were arguing that we were critical of the minister having powers in their bill, which they sent to a select committee and they died right there. It died right there. The difference is that they chose as an executive government to go with a model that has a commission. And that is their right. That is the prerogative of the executive to determine what governance structure should administer the industry. They choose a governance structure of a commission. And we were saying that if you choose that governance model, then you can't have an over-concentration of power in the minister because you have chosen a commission. Is either you have a commission and the commission is reposed with the power or you have a minister. But you can't have a commission that becomes a rubber stamp of the minister. And that, in essence, was our argument in relation to their bill. We chose a different method. We chose a different governance structure, rather. And our governance structure, or in our governance structure, the minister is the authority in the bill. We decided not to use a model other than that. And I cited in my presentation the number of countries that have a similar model to the one that we chose. And the one that we chose is the one that Trinidad has, for example. There is no commission in the Trinidad Bill or the Trinidad Law. The Trinidad Law has been there for 100 years. As I said in my presentation, one can argue that Trinidad didn't manage the proceeds of the industry, or one can argue that they did manage it intelligently and diligently. But no one can dispute that the industry in Trinidad has been a success story. And it was run by a minister. And it is being run by a minister. And that, that has been happening for 100 years. And where important decisions has to be made, the minister is required to consult with the cabinet. And that's the model that we use. The minister, in this case, is to consult with the cabinet. And an executive government elected by the people has a prerogative to determine how it will govern. And we feel, at this point in time, having the power in the minister, acting upon the directions of cabinet, is what is in the best interest of the industry at this point in time. We made it very clear that once we come out of the embryonic stages of the industry and the infrastructure is up and running and the industry itself is up and running, that we will move to, the, to a commission at a later stage. But at this point in time, the government wants to ensure that the industry is up and running without a commission being there who we see is not necessary at this point in time. And I want to draw attention to Article 106 of the Constitution. It says that there shall be a cabinet for Guyana which shall consist of the president the Prime Minister, the Vice President, and such other ministers as may be appointed to it by the President. The Cabinet shall aid and advise the President in the general direction and control of the government of Guyana and shall be collectively responsible, therefore, to the Parliament. So we are putting the functional responsibilities 
of this industry in the hands of the minister and cabinet collectively. And cabinet collectively under the constitution is answerable to the parliament. And I say that that is democracy. That is what the constitution prescribes. The parliament is comprised of the elected representatives of the people. So the cabinet is directly responsible for this industry to the parliament. So there is a clear line of accountability in if anything goes wrong, it is the minister and cabinet who must accept the responsibility. It is as simple as that. And that is accountable government. And the executive is, ent is, is entitled to choose that form and style of governance, if it wishes. So, that is, the, that, that is the only objection that they have with the Petroleum Activities Bill. And I believe that it's a good bill. No one, other than the, other than the concentration of power in the minister, no one has advanced another adverse comment in relation to the bill. No one, either in government or outside of government. Sorry, either in parliament or outside of the parliament. And I just thought that I will share those sentiments at the beginning of the program. So, if the industry fails, is the minister and the government. It is as simple as that. You, and we are elected. We are answerable to the parliament and we are answerable to the people. Not a commission that would have been comprised of persons who are not elected and who are not answerable. And that's the position of the government. So, I saw an interesting debate in the public domain about power sharing in government. And they speak of some super majority that must be introduced in the Constitution to ensure that the opposition and the government act consensually. The first observation that I wish to make is that this call for power sharing and shared governance only arises when the PPP is in government. Only when the PPP is in government, you hear about this power sharing call and this shared governance call. And it comes from the same set of persons. The PPP only took office in August of 2020, having lost government in 2015. For five long years, with the same identical power structure in the government and in the constitution. These very persons who are now calling for a redistribution of power and a sharing of power in the executive were very much in Guyana. But when AP and new AFC was in government, they did not find any problem or they did not have any complaint whatsoever in the way power was being exercised by the government of the day. The very people, they were comfortable with the status quo then. But every time the PPP gets into government, suddenly there is a clamor for power sharing and shared governance 
and they create the impression that the society will collapse and Guyana will implode and we will have ethnic strife and ethnic war unless power is shared. You hear it again. They had some confabulation recently and the call has emanated again from the usual suspects. When the no-confidence motion was passed in 2018 and the government was toppled, those very ones who are now loud in their advocacy for a super majority then were arguing that a simple majority can't topple the government. That is what they were arguing. That a simple majority can't effectively pass a no-confidence motion. Those very ones are the ones who are now calling for a superior majority. The way government is elected in Guyana, by way of a simple majority, is the way that government, governments are elected across the free and democratic world. There is no superior majority in the free, democratic, modern world of which we are a part. Certainly not in the Commonwealth, and not in the Western Hemisphere, of which we are a part. Every country, the government is elected by winning of a simple majority. But Guyana, for these people, is a different place whenever the PPP is in government. It only applies when the PPP is in government. It does not apply when APNU AFC was in government. It did not apply then. These are persons who want power other than by way of the ballot. And they want to get rid of the People's Progressive Party. They have a problem with the People's Progressive Party. And they are one set of people and you must ask yourselves why. Why every time the PPP is in government, all, thi all things are wrong with the constitution and the government structure. All things are wrong. And these are the people who are prepared to pervert the language of the constitution in order to argue that a no-confidence motion requires some special majority to pass, although the Constitution itself, in very clear language, speaks to a majority. A majority of 65, according to them, is not 33, but some other number. I remember when I was arguing the case in the Court of Appeal. I took a box of matches and I counted them before I went to the court. I put 65 matchsticks in the box. Mr. Christopher Ram was sitting next to me. And in the Court of Appeal, I tore open the box and I asked the courts leave. I asked the court's permission to do a demonstration with the 65 matchsticks. And I put 33 in one bundle. I counted 33 loudly in the court. One to 33, and I put 33 matchsticks on one side. And then I counted 32 matchsticks on the other side. And I asked, if this bundle of matchsticks belongs to Mary, and this bundle of matchsticks belongs to Jane. If 33 matchsticks 
belongs to Mary, and 32 matchsticks belongs to Jean, belong to Jean. Who, who have more matchsticks, Mary or Jean? Who have a majority of matchsticks, Mary or Jean? That is how I broke down the equation when I was appearing in the Court of Appeal in that case. And yet, the Court of Appeal ruled in the manner that it did. When we went to the Caribbean Court of Justice, I remember distinctly, Marcel Williams hired a lawyer from Belize to argue some parts of the appeal. And he said that he will argue that argument, that particular point. Remember, there were different grounds of appeal. And as he was going to the podium to argue that 33 is not a majority of 65, I distinctly recall Justice Witt asked him, what is it that he's going to argue? And he said he wants to argue that 33 is not a majority of 65. And Justice Witt promptly told him that the court will not hear him. The court will not hear that argument. It does not make sense. And Basil Williams had to go and take his seat. It's supposed to be on the website, the video. Must look at it. The CCJ refused to entertain that type of ludicrousity. Refused to entertain that type of ludicrousity. And still you hear now about some super majority. And somehow that will make the country work. Apparently the country is not working now. When certain people, having lost the elections, can't exercise governmental power, the country can't work. There is great disenchantment and great dismay and great pessimism just simply because they can't get government. That's what's happening here. Never mind. Try as we have in the past. We can't get an agreement for the appointment of the Chief Justice. We can't get an appointment for the, uh, can't get an agreement for the appointment of a Chancellor. That day, right there, is a mechanism for power sharing to take place. And it has never happened. It has never happened. And you now want a super majority to make every other decision? The only place where we have it, it has not worked. You want to preponderate the entire government structure with that type of mechanism? Then government will grind to a halt. Then you will have anarchy and chaos in the country. But perhaps that's what they want. That is what they want. They want power at all cost. Never mind it causes a complete destruction and annihilation of the country and the government. They don't care. Power at all cost. So they are going to concoct and fabricate these nonsensical formulations and spout it publicly at these various engagements that they are having throughout the year. But I ask the sensible Guyanese population, don't fall bait to the veneer of sophistication which they are using to wrap these clumsy and ridiculous permutations and argumentations. We are using a veneer of sophistication. It's a veneer only. So that it sounds intelligent and it sounds profound. It's a nasty, shameless grab for power without winning any elections. When we lost the elections, we filed our petition and we stayed out of government. We went to the parliament, we went to the people, and we did our political work. You hear any time we talk about power sharing and all this foolishness, 
We didn't. We went to the ground. We pulled our boots up, rolled up our sleeves, and went to the people. And they put us back into government. That is democracy. That is democracy. One of the very people who love to speak about the rule of law and about constitutionality is Lincoln Lewis. And if you read today's paper, today, sorry, Starbrook News, Tuesday the, Tuesday the 5th of August, there's a long letter in which the author of the letter, who is the owner of an establishment called Village Voice, is complaining bitterly to the populace, to the public, to the medium of the letter column of the Starbrook News, that Lincoln Lewis is refusing to obey an order of the High Court to pay the gentleman $3.5 million and to stop using the man's name, Village Voice the man's business name, and violating a court order is the epitome of lawlessness. Violating a court order is defying the rule of law. It is one of the clearest demonstration of contempt for the rule of law, the constitution, the justice system, and the laws themselves. That is what you do when you ignore or refuse to comply with a court order. It means that you are telling the justice system, you are telling the population, you are telling the judges to hell with them. You are not going to be governed by any law. And that is what Lincoln Lewis is, an anarchist. And I've, I've not said so now. I've said so a long time. Lincoln Lewis was among the anarchists who were calling for President Granger to swear himself in, even though he had lost the elections. Hamilton Green, Lincoln Lewis, and a, a band of them were calling on President Granger to swear himself in, ignore the will of the people, ignore the election results, and he must continue to govern. That's what Lincoln Lewis represents. That's Lincoln Lewis ideology. And that is why he continues to bully people in West Coast Barbies under the pretext that his forefathers own land there. And he can't produce a one scintilla of evidence, of title for the land that he's asserting his grandfather and I don't know who else owns. It's people like Lincoln Lewis and Hamilton Green and they masquerade all the time as respected elders giving people's adv people advice and want to champion the rule of law and want to speak about constitutionality. They were among the people calling on President Granger to continue to squat in office and don't concede that he lost the 2015 elections. And that is long after the recount. Long after the recount, results were disclosed. These are the people. And they, they are the ones who are part of that bandwagon. <clears throat> calling for power sharing now and they want to masquerade as law abiding citizens and champions of the rule of law somebody here saying that Jack Dale ignoring court order to pay 20 million to a case that he lost that case is still in the court system, my friend. You must get the facts. I don't mind you coming and talk these things, 
But permit me to explain to you that in the court system, you have an appellate process. Mr. Jack Day was never heard. Mr. Jack Day was never heard. It was an ex parte default judgment granted against him. I was his lawyer. We were never heard in that case. And we have appealed that decision as we are entitled to do. In Lincoln Lewis case, based upon what the gentleman has written, he has not appealed. He has simply refused to obey the court order. And the gentleman wrote a whole article about it. He has not appealed. So there is a difference, my friend. A huge difference. So last Friday, His Excellency the President has sworn in the commissioners who are to preside over the Madhya Commission of Inquiry into the fire at the Madhya dormitory, dormitory, sorry, and the persons are Major General Retired Joe Singh as chairman. Well, that was known long before now. And chairman of the National Tushau Council, Derek John, along with Dr. Kim Kite Thomas, head of the Department of Law, University of Guyana. So I believe that it's a properly comprised and composed commission. You have Mr. Singh as chairman. You have the Red John, an Amerindian leader, and, and, and an Amerindian leader of the caliber to have been elected by the Amerindian themselves to head the National Tushau Council, the legal institutional body representing Amerindians in the country. And you have Dr. Kim Kai Thomas, a lawyer who is head of the Department of Law at the University of Guyana. And of course, she is a female, and you have females who are in that dorm. So you have gender mix, you have ethnic mix, you have Amerindian presence, and so I, and you have a lawyer, you have a trained army officer, trained in many other disciplines, and you have an Amerindian leader. So I believe that this is a suitably qualified uh, commission. They will begin their work shortly, the terms of reference will be published, I think, tomorrow in the official gazette. And the home of the inquiry or the seat of the inquiry will be that premises at Middle Street, Georgetown, opposite the Hibiscus restaurant where the Commission of Inquiry into the elections was conducted. That very premises will be used to be the seat of this Commission of Inquiry. Um, I want to speak a little about an article which I see published I saw published in the Kaicho News, bearing the caption, Attorney General should apologize for describing Guyanese as obstructionists. And that description by me is contained in a court document in a pending matter before the High Court. And it is in a challenge filed by two citizens against the gas to shore energy project. These two citizens form part of a narrow group of persons who have been filing one case after another in respect of operations in the oil and gas sector. From the moment the PPP got into government, they have been filing. 
Firstly, let me make it abundantly clear that the contract was signed in 2016. The signing bonus was paid and received in 2016 and denied by the finance minister. It was not paid into the consolidated fund as the constitution mandates such monies to be paid, but was deposited in an account at Bank of Guyana, which was opened upon the direction in writing of the very minister who publicly said that he never received the signing bonus and that Guyana never received that signing bonus. But documents subsequently established that he wrote to the Bank of Guyana to open this special account to deposit the money. An environmental permit was granted for a period of 20 years when the law says it can only be granted for five years. There was unmitigated flaring when they start production on the APNU. The LISA 1 license and the LISA 2 license did not have any financial assurance as required by the Environmental Protection Act. There was no insurance at all as is required both under the Petroleum Act and the Environmental Protection Act. But production had started. These very people, Transparency International and John Key and Radzik and that group, that entire group, they never filed any action. They did not file any action on the APNU AFC. From the moment the PPP got into government, litigation after litigation, litigation after litigation. So that's the first point I want to make. They are filing most of these cases under an act called the Judicial Review Act. The Judicial Review Act was passed by the PPP government in 2010. Judicial Review is the type of litigation which allows the ordinary citizen to legally challenge the decisions, actions, and or omissions of public officers, ministers, statutory bodies, state, state agencies, or any public body. It is through judicial review that you challenge the exercise of power and the exercise of discretion by public officers or tribunals established by the law, all public bodies or public officers. <clears throat> it is the PPP that introduced that legislation in 2010. Significantly, anyone can, if they wish, do a comparison between the Guyana Judicial Review Act and any other such legislation in the Caribbean. And you will see that Guyana has the most liberal and most advanced judicial review law in the Caribbean. Most countries, you have to go and get what is called leave before you can even issue the proceedings. In other words, you have to go and make out a case to a judge <coughs> before you get permission to file the substantive case. That is not the position in Guyana. You go to the court right away and you file your judicial review case. Secondly, secondly, many jurisdictions in the Caribbean, their laws provide that if there is an alternative remedy, you must not come for judicial review. 
our law says that notwithstanding and despite the existence of an alternative remedy, you can file judicial review. That's the second point I want to make. And thirdly, any person who is affected can file proceedings. Any person. As I said, the PPP introduced that legislation in this country to hold government accountable, to hold ministers accountable, to hold public bodies accountable. And we could have followed the, all the other legislation to make it difficult. We didn't. We made it the most liberal piece of legislation in this hemisphere on that matter. We didn't have to do that if we were not encouraging of scrutiny. Judicial review is one of the central features of litigation that ensures that there is transparency, good governance, and proper decision making at the level of government and the state. It is judicial review that ensures that the rules of natural justice are observed, that discretionary power is not abused, that discretionary power is exercised reasonably and not vindictively, that one must take into account relevant factors and must not be guided by irrelevance and must not be guided by vindictiveness, ill will and spite and those things, that the decision must not be capricious, arbitrary, etc. It is judicial review that does all of that. The act was passed in 2010, but could not have been brought into force because the procedure for the act was in the civil procedure rules of 2016. Those rules only came into force in 2016. Only then the act could have been activated. And do you know what Basil Williams did, the attorney general, who had the power to bring the Judicial Review Act into force by an order? He refused to bring the act into force. I was out in private practice in the opposition. I wrote him and he refused to bring the same act into force that allowing all of them to file proceedings. Anil Nandlal in his own name filed a case against Basil Williams and got a judge to compel him to bring the act into force. He appealed to the Court of Appeal and I won again. Well, I won everything against him, so I'm not here to blow my own trumpet, just to remind you. He lost again, and that's how the act came into force. Not only did the PPP pass the act in the parliament in 2010, but in opposition, it is I, the PPP, who had to get an order of the High Court and then the Court of Appeal to bring the act into force. APNU AFC did not want to bring the act into force. And we have that act there now. And we are, people are filing cases every day. And we are defending them. I have not once discouraged people from challenging the government in court. But there are parameters, there are principles. Now this case that I am dealing with, the challenge, the challenge filed by these two citizens relate to a permission granted by the Environmental Protection Agency to the licensee, Exxon Mobil, an environmental permit Exxon got from the EPA to enter into certain private lands to start work for the pipelines. Now, about 60 private owners, lands we are speaking about, government has engaged those people. And we have acquired all those lands and we are paying compensation. None of those people whose lands Exxon entering on, file anything. 
None of the people. Anybody who should have filed would have been those people. Because it's their land. The people have no problem with the government. They settled all their claims with the government. These two busybodies looking on from the outside, they sue the government. Why must I not call them nuisance and busybodies? That is what the law calls them. Not me. There is no case. The people who are affected, the people's lands, upon where the operation is taking place, have not, they have no problem. But these two, who don't own anything, are busy bodies, and they're suing the government. Why, why, why should I? It's a waste of the court's time in my respectful view. And that is why I said what I said. Now they cited one case where one person, one person out of 60, file a case against the government. Not because they are opposed to the government taking the land, but the gentleman is saying that he got to spend some money on adjacent lands, lands that are next door to the land that the government is taking. He has no problem with the government paying him to take the land where the pipeline got to run. But he also owns the land next door. And he's saying that if the pipeline run is running there, then he got to do some additional work to properly drain his land because where his land is being drained now is where the government is taking. So the government taking away the draining for his other lands and he wants compensation for that, for, so that he can properly drain his other lands. That is why he demands sue the government. Not because he is opposed to the government running the pipeline. In other words, none, none of the owners of the land have opposed, and the government has acquired them all. And these two busybodies, who apparently have nothing to do in life, sue the government. And I describe them as obstructionists. It is in that context that I made those statements. So I thought that I will just put that on the public record. Tomorrow, we will be, there is going to be the commissioning of a brand new courthouse at Vigilance on the east coast of Demerara. Millions of dollars have been spent in the construction of a very modern, very attractive edifice to house the Vigilance Magistrates Court. And now, the way that the courts are being built, they are all air-conditioned. They all have living quarters for the magistrates. They all have elevators. And I believe that this building will accommodate more than one court, as well as the magisterial office for the East Demerara Magisterial District. So it's a huge building, and tomorrow it will be commissioned. That is progress. Then, on Friday, I have been invited to turn the sod at Timiri, for the construction of another magistrate's court at Timeri on the east bank of the Amarara. That will, happen, that will happen on Friday. We are turning the sod. I have been invited by the judiciary to attend. And then next Monday, we are turning the sod for another magistrate's court at Friendship on the east bank of the Amarara. So at Friendship on the east bank of the Amarara, very close to where the new highway will be built, connecting straight to the linden Suzdike Highway, a new magistrate's court will be constructed there, and we will be turning the sod for the construction of that court as well at Friendship on the east bank of the Amarara. That my friends, 
is progress. You would have seen that we launched a restorative justice program in Region 5, and I plan to do it in several regions of the country. Restorative justice is now a part and parcel of our formal legal system, and we have to ensure that we train a sufficient number of persons in each magisterial district across the length and breadth of Guyana because restorative justice requires the public to participate actively in the justice system at the level of the magistrate's court in minor offenses, nonviolent offenses. But before we can get people involved, we have to train them in the area of restorative justice. Former Commissioner of Police, Mr. Sila al Pasad, has been appointed as director of the Restorative Justice Center. He is well trained in that area, and he will be conducting, along with other experts, the training exercise in the various regions. But we will start with a public awareness campaign across the various regions. We have done one in Esequibo. I have done, we have done one in Region 5, we are moving to Region 6, then Region 3, and we'll do a few in Region 4, and then we'll move into the outlying areas, Region 10, etc., so that we'll bring the entire country on board with restorative justice, and we want people to be, come involved, to be part of the justice system. It's an opportunity that allows the, the society to integrate into the justice system in a meaningful way. And, and I've explained so many times what are the elements of restorative justice. I don't think that um, I need to do that again. Um, I was looking at uh, if you have anything that you would like me to address, but um, I'm not seeing any, any um, input from you in that regard. Um, so persons have been asking both on Facebook and to writing the ministry to find out how they can be part of the restorative justice training program. Uh, that information is going to be made public and you will be provided with the details and the contact information. And there is a machinery in place that will be activated to ensure that you are trained and you become part of the restorative justice, um, the restorative justice program of Guyana. Land regularization. So we have begun, as many of you may know, this process of looking at our country and there are gaps where there are no titles. People have been living in villages for years and since under President Ramotar, we began this initiative through the agency of the Ministry of Legal Affairs and in collaboration with Lands and Surveys Commission, we have begun the process of doing land registration, regularization and registration so that people can get their titles. This weekend I was in Barbies and we are doing num regions, uh, village number two, three, four, and five villages on the west coast of Barbies. And I made the point, which I want to make now again, that this, what we are doing here, giving people title to their lands, is real empowerment. You, I listened to them speaking at Boxton Line Top, and I listened to them speaking and this kind of activities and that kind of activities and University 101 and Comms TV, and they, they talk about empowerment, but that's all that they do. They talk. They talk. These villages, most of the residents here are afro Guyanese. Number two, number three, four, and five, Villages West Coast Barbies are mostly afro Guyanese, And we are issuing titles to them 
as we are doing in other villages in the country. We started at Cotton Tree and we are moving down the line. We have done it at Enterprise. We have done it on the west coast of the Amarara. We have done it, we are doing it in Esiquipo. We are doing it on the Quarantine Coast and we are doing it in West Coast Barbies. That is empowering people. We went into Anne's Grove a few weeks ago and we began an exercise that would ensure that over 450 families get title for land that they, they and their four parents have been occupying since the abolition of slavery. You hear that? Since the abolition of slavery, they have been uh, occupying lands in Anne's Grove without title. A PPP government went in there, headed by our Prime Minister and our Minister of, of Housing and Lands and Surveys and yours truly, and we commenced an initiative that will issue two families. After 200 years or more, they are going to get title in Anne's Grove. That is empowerment. Not talking about ancestral lands and causing strife in the country. It's giving the people title for the lands that they are occupying, that they own, but they don't have formal paper title. It is those titles that they can now hold up to the world and see that they own that land. That they can say to the bank, that this is my title, I want to borrow a loan. That they can pledge to educate their children. That they can transmit in a legal way now properties to their heir and their beneficiaries. That is empowering people. Not fooling people about power sharing. Not fooling people that if you get into government, you will share out oil money. Not telling people that they're not instilling hatred into people that they're, 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 they're not getting a fair share of the oil wealth of the country. Where the oil wealth is being used to develop every corner of this country. There are a lot more things that I would like to say, but I'll leave it for next week when I, as we continue this discourse. Because I, I, I've seen this, this racism again, raising its ugly head. And as I have said before, we are not going to sit idly and stay quiet when this racism starts. We are going to counter because racism is an evil that will destroy this country. And there are a few people who are persecuting and prosecuting a racist agenda, and we will not allow their racism to go unanswered. So my friends, thank you very much for staying with me for the past hour or, or so. I think that we have had a good exchange and good um, engagement. I want you to join me next week for another program of issues in the news, but until then, enjoy the rest of your evening and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much and I see you next week Tuesday.